How do you define Roger Clemens? Clemens was extreme. He threw harder than everyone else. He was bigger than everyone else. He won more Cy Young awards than everyone else. Clemens was explosive. He hit opposing batters on purpose. He fought his managers. He once threatened to assault Hank Aaron. Yes, that Hank Aaron. Even his nickname, Rocket, was a reference to both his pitch speed and his propensity for outbursts. He could be intimidating, volatile, and aggressive. He was also one of the most dominant pitchers of his era, if not all time. However, in spite of his success on the field, Clemens' career has been overshadowed by controversy and scandal, turning what was once a surefire Hall of Famer into an outcast from the game. You might think you know Roger Clemens, but do you know the whole story? Let's get into it. As an adult, Roger Clemens would call Houston his home. You might even be forgiven for thinking that Texas is where Clemens was born and raised, but that's not where this story begins. Roger Clemens was born in Ohio in 1962, the youngest child born to Bill and Bess Clemens. Bill Clemens, a truck driver, wasn't around often, going on road trips that could last for weeks at a time. It was during one of these trips that Bess packed her children into the car and left Bill for good. Roger was just three months old. Two years later, Bess married a mechanic named Woody Boer. It was Woody who Roger saw as his dad. They went on motorcycle rides, ate ice cream, and watched the TV show Bonanza together. In the fall of 1970, however, tragedy struck when Woody died of a heart attack. At just nine years old, Roger Clemens had lost a father for the second time. With his mother working, Roger turned to his older brother Randy for guidance. It was Randy who instilled in Roger the philosophy of winning above all else. Roger took this advice to heart, promising friends and family that he would one day start the MLB All-Star Game, appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and win the final game of the World Series. When Clemens was 15, he moved to Houston with Randy. Under his brother's eye, Roger became fully devoted to athletics. He ran sprints and started weightlifting, just like his MLB idol, Nolan Ryan. By the time he finished high school, Clemens had yet to find a college team that would take him. He dreamed of pitching for the University of Texas, but settled for San Jacinto, a local junior college. It was at San Jack where Clemens bloomed. His fastball climbed to the mid-90s, and he finished his freshman year with a 9-2 record. In the 12th round of the 1981 draft, he was selected by the New York Mets. A few days later, Clemens found himself at the Astrodome, throwing in front of Mets skipper Joe Torre and pitching coach Bob Gibson. New York offered him $20,000, but he turned them down. See, just before the draft, Clemens had been contacted by Cliff Gustafson, longtime head coach for the University of Texas. Gustafson offered Roger a scholarship, access to the Longhorn's world-class facilities, and a chance to play at his dream school. Clemens took the offer in a heartbeat. As the number two starter behind Calvin Schiraldi, Clemens went 12-2 his first spring as a Longhorn. He entered the next season with high expectations, MLB scouts dotted the sidelines at his starts to see if this 20-year-old was the real deal. That June, he was picked 19th overall by the Boston Red Sox. Roger Clemens was going pro. Through his first few games in the minors, Roger Clemens was not as good as expected. He was better. He dominated Class A and was just as great in Double A. That winter, he met Debbie, the woman who would become his wife. On May 11th, 1984, he was called up to the majors. He wore the number 21, his brother Randy's old high school number. Fans and the media alike were buzzing with excitement over the young righty. For all the hype, however, Roger Clemens' debut was less than stellar. At a frigid Cleveland Municipal Stadium, Clemens lasted five and two-thirds, allowing 11 hits and striking out just four. As he walked off the field, the 4,000 fans in attendance showered him with insults. He rebounded quickly his next start, a seven-inning effort in Minnesota that Boston won 5-4. For the rest of his rookie year, Clemens was a solid starter. He became a favorite of team leaders like Jim Rice and Dwight Evans, as well as fellow pitcher Dennis Oilcan Boyd. Clemens and the Sox entered 1985 with high hopes, with a strong starting rotation, batting champion Wade Boggs, and a new manager in John McNamara. Many assumed Boston would compete for the AL pennant, Instead, they finished in fifth place, while Clemens battled pain in his pitching shoulder. That August, 
he underwent a season-ending operation to repair a torn labrum. Come 1986, nobody knew what to expect from Roger. He showed up to spring training and was pummeled in game after game. He then proceeded to start the regular season with a win versus the White Sox, then a complete game against the Royals. By April 29th, he was sitting on a 3-0 record with 19 strikeouts. That night, though, he took it to another level. It was a home game against the Seattle Mariners. In the crowd sat 13,000 fans, less than half of Fenway Park's capacity. As he climbed the mound for the top of the first, Clemens stared down leadoff hitter Spike Owen. Owen had been Roger's teammate in Texas, a role model for the young pitcher. Tonight, though, they were enemies. Gripping the ball tightly, Clemens reared back and fired it in for strike one. The next pitch was high and inside, sending Owen to the dirt. Seven pitches later, with the count full, he struck him out swinging. He did the same with the next two batters, punching out the side and bringing Fenway to its feet. He struck out two more in the second, one in the third, and three in the fourth. By the top of the seventh, he had racked up 14 Ks. By the top of the ninth, he had 18, one away from tying the MLB record. Standing in his way, once again, was Spike Owen. After a called strike and a foul ball, Owen whiffed at a 96 mile an hour fastball, Clemens 129th pitch of the night for strike three. He was now one strikeout away from history. Facing left fielder Phil Bradley, Clemens worked the count to two and two, then unleashed a fastball. A new record! Clemens has set a major league record for strikeouts in a game. 20. The congratulations came pouring in. His teammates mobbed him on the field, Nolan Ryan sent him a telegram. He received a phone call from Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy and another from Governor Michael Dukakis. Sports Illustrated put him on the cover. The dominance didn't stop there. He won one start after another, becoming just the fifth pitcher ever to begin a season 14-0. The Red Sox, for their part, entered the All-Star break with a seven-game division lead. Clemens was picked to start the 86 All-Star game, held in the Houston Astrodome. He tossed three scoreless innings, striking out two as the AL won 3-2. After the game, Clemens was given the All-Star Game MVP. In the span of a few months, he had accomplished two of his biggest childhood dreams. Soon, he'd get his chance at the third. The Athens and Sparta of Baseball That's how Sports Illustrated described the Red Sox and the Mets entering the 86 World Series. Boasting all-stars like Gary Carter, Daryl Strawberry, and Keith Hernandez, the 108-win Mets were the odds-on favorite. Boston, meanwhile, hadn't won a championship since 1918. Tickets for this series were hard to come by. This was a problem for fans, especially because they didn't have access to today's sponsor, Game Time. Has this ever happened to you? You're sitting at home, bored, wishing you were somewhere, anywhere else. Somewhere like a baseball game for example. And then you see it. The answer to your prayers. The solution to your boredom. Game Time. Game Time is a one-of-a-kind service that makes it faster and easier to get into your favorite events at a moment's notice. They specialize in last-minute tickets, which means that with the Game Time app, prices actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. Save up to 60% off when buying last-minute tickets to sports, concerts, comedy, and theater. With GameTime's all-in pricing option, you get the total cost up front, with no surprise fees at checkout. And with their lowest price guarantee, if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, GameTime will credit you 110% of the difference. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code HISTORIAN for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, download the GameTime app today, create an account, and redeem code H-I-S-T-O-R-I-A-N for $20 off. Game time. Last minute deals. Lowest price. Guaranteed. The Sox took game one, one nothing. Battling a bad flu, Clemens diligently prepared for his game two start. Taking the mound for the Mets would be 21-year-old Dwight Gooden. Gooden was a generational talent, having posted a 24-4 record the year before, alongside 268 strikeouts, and a minuscule 1-5-3 ERA. He and Clemens were easily the most exciting young pitchers of the 1980s. 
It was the matchup everyone had been waiting for, Dr. K versus The Rocket. 55,000 fans packed into a sold-out Shea Stadium to watch the Aces do battle. Instead, what they got was a blowout, as Clemens and Gooden allowed a combined nine runs. Neither of them lasted past the fifth, and Boston won 9-3. The Mets took the next two games, tying the series at two apiece. The Red Sox answered in Game 5, with a 4-2 victory. The series returned to New York, with Boston one win away from their first title in 68 years. Roger Clemens was given the ball for Game 6, and with it, the chance to win the final game of the World Series. He wasted no time getting to work, tossing four hitless innings while the offense pulled ahead 2-0. The Mets tagged him for two runs in the fifth, but the Red Sox scored again to go up 3-2. Following a scoreless seventh, Clemens was pulled aside by manager John McNamara. What was said between the two remains disputed to this day. Whatever it was, though, Clemens was pulled, and Calvin Schiraldi, his former University of Texas teammate, was put in. What happened next is the stuff of baseball legend. Schiraldi gave up the tying run in the eighth. Dave Henderson hit a solo shot in extras, followed by an RBI single from Marty Barrett to put the Sox up 5-3. Schiraldi retired the first two hitters in the bottom of the 10th, before allowing three straight singles and a run. He was replaced with Bob Stanley, who let the tying run score on a wild pitch. Stanley then got Mookie Wilson to roll over on one, sending a weak ground ball to first baseman Bill Buckner. And, well, you can fill in the rest. Little roller up along first, behind the bag! It gets through Buckner! Here comes Knight and the Mets win! After the game, McNamara was asked by reporters about the decision to remove Clemens. He told them that he had wanted to leave him in, but Roger begged out of the game. Upon hearing what his manager said, Clemens had to be restrained from charging into McNamara's office. Two nights later, the Mets won Game 7 and the series. New York fans began tossing beer bottles onto the field, and one of them hit a Red Sox employee on the head. Roger Clemens screamed into the stands, This place sucks! They ought to blow the whole place up. Despite its ending, the 1986 season had been historically great for Roger Clemens. Across 33 starts, he racked up 24 wins, posted a 2.48 ERA, and struck out 238 batters. His winning percentage, ERA, and WHIP were all first in the league, and he was the unanimous vote for the AL Cy Young. Clemens had been so good, in fact, that the writers decided to name him the American League MVP, making him the first starting pitcher to win the award since Vita Blue in 1971, although not everyone thought he was worthy of the honor. Hank Aaron, a Hall of Famer and MVP in his own right, was of the opinion that since position players couldn't win a Cy Young, pitchers shouldn't be able to win the MVP. Now, this isn't an uncommon argument and it didn't really have anything to do with Clemens so much as the principle of the awards. Nevertheless, Roger took it personally. He said that he wished Aaron were still playing, so he could, quote, crack his head open to show him how valuable he was. This would have been controversial to say about anyone, but to threaten Hank Aaron, a man who was, for all intents and purposes, a baseball saint, that was unforgivable. The press lit into Clemens, and his role as a heel was firmly cemented. If the negativity affected him, he didn't seem to show it, at least on the field. He went 20-9 in 1987, struck out 256, and won a second Cy Young. The Red Sox, on the other hand, finished fifth in the division by a long shot. As the legend of Roger Clemens grew, so did the ego. He handed out signed photos of himself. He insisted that people call him the Rocket Man. Even his kids' names were a reference to his strikeouts, all starting with the letter K. He started the 88 season strong, but imploded down the home stretch. Boston won the division by a game, but lost the ALCS to an Oakland squad led by Jose Canseco and Mark McGuire. Clemens' struggles continued in 89. The fans criticized him for complaining about having to carry his own bags. His teammates criticized him for his me-first attitude. He even fought with groundskeepers. Roger was still one of the best pitchers in the league, but a fan favorite, he was not. He missed time in 1990 with a shoulder injury, but returned in time for the ALCS, a rematch with the Oakland A's. Taking the mound for Game 4, he sported a goatee, eye black, and Ninja Turtles cleats. 
it was an unusual look for the typically clean-cut pitcher. After a spotless first, Clemens ran into trouble in the second inning. Following a walk to Willie Randolph, he was ejected for arguing with home plate umpire Terry Cooney. An enraged Clemens charged the ump, hurling insult after insult before being ushered off the field. He was suspended five games for threatening to kill Cooney. Commissioner Faye Vincent would later clarify, quote, You can't kill umpires. It's just not allowed. That offseason, Clemens signed a record $21 million contract with Boston. On the mound, he was untouchable. He won a third Cy Young in 1991 with the help of a new splitter that he called, appropriately, Mr. Splitty. Despite a last place finish for Boston, Clemens was an all-star in 92. The 93 season was the worst of Roger Clemens' career by far. He went 11-14, his first sub-500 record, while his ERA jumped to 4-4-6. He pitched better during the strike-shortened 94 campaign, but with GM Dan Duquette looking to revamp the club with young talent, it was clear that Roger's days in Boston were numbered. He was diagnosed with a shoulder strain in early 1995 and lost his only start that postseason. He still had moments of brilliance, like when he tied his own record with 20 strikeouts versus the Tigers. But Clemens, now 34, was far from the ace he'd once been. He made his last start of 1996 on September 28th. As he walked off the field in the eighth, Fenway Park showered him with applause. He ended his Red Sox career with 192 wins, 38 shutouts, and 2,590 strikeouts, all franchise highs. Dan Duquette offered him a four-year deal that offseason, more of a courtesy than anything else. Behind the scenes, he told a different story. Clemens was lazy, spoiled, and in the, quote, twilight of his career. In December 1996, Roger Clemens signed a three-year deal with the Toronto Blue Jays worth $24 million, making him the highest paid pitcher in history. I'm gonna be a while. Desperate to prove Duquette wrong, Roger Clemens didn't just return to form with the Blue Jays. He was better than ever. He won 21 games in 1997, posting a 2.05 ERA and striking out 292 en route to another Cy Young. In his first start back at Fenway, he struck out 16 Red Sox over eight innings and left the field glaring angrily at the Boston owner's box. The message had been sent. Roger Clemens was back. Just a year or two earlier, his fastball had topped out at 92 miles an hour, while his physique looked like that of a, well, 34-year-old. Now, though, he was throwing in the high 90s again, with the body of a prize fighter. Something had changed. It's not known exactly when Roger Clemens first took steroids. Some say it was the mid-90s, when Jose Canseco joined the Red Sox. The two had been golfing buddies and had regular conversations about the pros and cons of PED use. After the 97 season, Clemens pressured the Blue Jays to sign Canseco. Most evidence, however, points to 1998, the year Roger first met Brian McNamee. McNamee was the strength and conditioning coach for the Blue Jays, but had spent the years before that as a bullpen catcher for the Yankees, and before that as an officer for the NYPD. Which is how, in the summer of 98, he found himself on the receiving end of a strange request. Roger Clemens, the 35-year-old Toronto ace and surefire Hall of Famer, wanted to know if McNamee would inject him with steroids. The trainer agreed. A few days later, he administered an injection of Winstrol, an anabolic steroid which Roger had obtained himself. It wasn't long before Clemens was taking steroids on a regular basis, every four days at first, then every three. It was almost always at his apartment, and it was always away from his teammates and coaches. By season's end, his fastball was hitting 100 miles an hour, he'd won 20 games, and received a record fifth Cy Young Award. Still, he wasn't satisfied. The Blue Jays were toiling away in third place, and he wanted to be on a winning team. That winter, Roger Clemens was traded to the Yankees, the winningest team in baseball, in exchange for Graham Lloyd, Homer Bush, and David Wells. Clemens' first season in New York was inconsistent. He struggled to find his footing, and by the All-Star break, he was sporting a 470 ERA. 
Owner George Steinbrenner blasted him to the press and lamented the loss of Wells. To the public, the reason for Clemens' decline was a mystery. For Roger, though, it was obvious. He missed Brian McNamee. He was still using PEDs, but without the guidance of his personal trainer, he was lost. He was trounced in the ALCS by the Red Sox and Pedro Martinez, his spiritual replacement in Boston. Despite that loss, the Yankees won the ALCS and the first three World Series games against the Atlanta Braves. Clemens, who by then had been moved to the back of the rotation, got the ball for Game 4. This time, he delivered, and New York won 4-1. It may have taken him 15 years, but Roger Clemens finally had a ring. Prior to the 2000 season, Roger Clemens persuaded the Yankees to hire Brian McNamee. The pitcher paid the trainer out of his own pocket. Soon enough, the pair were back to their old habits, with McNamee making regular visits to Clemens' apartment, injecting him with testosterone and human growth hormone. He had a rough start to that year's postseason, losing both starts in the division series versus the A's. He bounced back in the next series, striking out an ALCS record 15 Seattle Mariners. A few days later, the Yankees would advance to yet another World Series, this time against the Crosstown Mets. The Subway Series wasn't Clemens' first encounter with the Mets. They had drafted him all the way back in 81. Then, of course, there was the 86 World Series. Lately, however, there was one Met in particular who had gotten on his nerves. Mike Piazza faced Roger Clemens 22 times in his career. Over that span, he possessed a 421 batting average, a 1605 OPS, and four home runs. It's a small sample size for sure, but if there's any hitter who had Roger's number, it was Piazza. Perhaps that's why, on July 8, 2000, Clemens threw a fastball straight at Piazza's head. The Mets were outraged, while the Yankees struggled to defend their pitcher's actions. To hit somebody in the head, you don't do that, said Joe Torre. Piazza was diagnosed with a concussion and missed the All-Star game. Unsurprisingly, by the time the World Series came around, many wondered what would happen in the Clemens-Piazza rematch. They didn't have to wait long to find out. In the first inning, on a 1-2 count, Clemens jammed Piazza with an inside fastball. Piazza's bat snapped, sending the barrel toward the mound. Any normal person would have left it at that and moved on to the next pitch. Unfortunately, Roger Clemens is not a normal person. The barrel of the bat comes back at Roger Clemens and he fires the bat back toward Piazza who is going down the first baseline. For whatever reason, Clemens wasn't ejected for throwing a baseball bat at another human being. He told the ump that he thought it was the ball, a claim so laughable you could be excused for thinking he was joking. In a career full of hit batters, media feuds, and on-field blow-ups, this was easily the biggest scandal Roger Clemens had faced. So far. It's easy to look back today and wonder, wonder how nobody figured out what was really going on with Roger Clemens. How was it possible that a 38-year-old, a decade and a half into his career, was still hurling fastballs in the high 90s, still winning Cy Youngs, still packing on pound after pound of pure muscle. At the time though, most fans and media members were more than happy not to know. In an article published in July 2001, USA Today described the pitcher's daily workout routine, long distance running, sprints, heavy leg work, and up to 2,000 stomach crunches. In September, Newsday wrote that Brian McNamee was Clemens' quote, secret weapon. McNamee, however, was beginning to worry Although Roger continued to dominate in 2001, winning his sixth Cy Young, McNamee decided he needed some insurance in case things turned south. He stashed steroid vials, needles, and gauze he had used to wipe up Clemens' blood into a Ziploc bag and saved it in a box in his basement. In the months following the 2002 campaign, Clemens, now 40 years old, announced that 2003 would be his final season. Thus began the Roger Clemens farewell tour. Gallons of ink were spilled talking about his legacy. Hours of broadcasts were spent discussing his accomplishments. He and Debbie were featured in Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. When he made his final regular season start at Fenway, the Boston faithful gave the New York Yankee a standing ovation. 
Clemens finished the season with 310 career wins, six Cy Youngs, and the admiration of the baseball world. That November, he reiterated that he was done for good. Three months later, however, he changed his mind, signing a one-year, $5 million contract with the Astros. Houstonians were elated to have one of their own wearing an Astros uniform. New Yorkers felt bamboozled, tearing into the pitcher for his betrayal. Off the field, Clemens relished the hype. On the field, he was electric, becoming the oldest player ever to win the Cy Young Award. Yet again, Roger Clemens decided to postpone his retirement. He signed another one-year deal with Houston, this time for $18 million. It was the highest annual salary earned by an MLB pitcher in history. In February of 2005, Jose Canseco published his tell-all book, Juiced, in which he accused Clemens, his former teammate, of steroid use. When asked about it, Roger told reporters that, quote, when you're under house arrest and have ankle bracelets on, you have a lot of time to write a book. Although he finished the season with a career-low 187 ERA, 2005 was touched by tragedy for Roger Clemens. That September, in the midst of the playoff race, his mother Bess passed away. In a statement to the New York Post, Clemens said that his mother's dying wish was that he retire after the season. This retirement, however, lasted only a bit longer than the previous one. In May 2006, he signed another one-year deal with the Astros. He pitched well enough, but people were starting to tire of his selfishness, unreliability, and seemingly insatiable desire for attention. That offseason, despite his insistence that he was once again done with baseball, he was offered deals by the Astros, the Red Sox, and the Yankees. On May 6, 2007, he made his decision in the most Roger Clemens way possible. Roger Clemens is in George's box, and Roger Clemens is coming back. Oh my good, goodness gracious. Of all the dramatic things, of all the dramatic things I've ever seen, Roger Clemens standing right in George Steinbrenner's box, announcing he is back. Roger Clemens is a new if you had told any baseball fan 10 years earlier that Clemens would still be pitching at age 45, let alone as one of the highest paid players in the league, they would have said you were crazy. And yet, there he was, taking the mound at Yankee Stadium for his 24th MLB season. He was undeniably mediocre in 07, going 6 and 6 with a 418 ERA, following his last start in which he lasted just two and a third against Cleveland in the ALDS. He hinted that he'd return for yet another season. Eventually, though, the fairy tale would have to come to an end, one way or another. For as obvious as it seems in hindsight, Roger Clemens had been able to avoid the worst of the steroid allegations that haunted MLB at the time. Sure, there had been rumors, like when former Yankees pitcher Jason Grimsley accused Clemens of using PEDs. But he wasn't Mark McGuire, who'd been called to appear in front of Congress alongside Sammy Sosa, Rafael Palmero, and others. He wasn't Barry Bonds, who'd been indicted for lying about his use of steroids. And he definitely wasn't Jose Canseco, who had been more than willing to publicize his cheating. For the right price, of course. On December 13, 2007, though, that would all change with the release of the Report of the Commissioner of Baseball of an independent investigation into the illegal use of steroids and other performance-enhancing substances by players in Major League Baseball. You might know it better as the Mitchell Report. The Mitchell Report was a 409-page document citing phone records, canceled checks, and written testimony regarding steroids in baseball. 89 players were mentioned by name, including stars like Andy Pettit, Eric Gagne, and yes, Roger Clemens. Most of the evidence against Clemens came from Brian McNamee, who also claimed he gave human growth hormone to Andy Pettit in 2002. Clemens firmly denied any wrongdoing, but there were two problems with this strategy. The first was that McNamee had the vials, needles, and gauze used by Roger. The second was that two days after the Mitchell report was released, Pettit put out a statement confirming that he had, in fact, used HGH. In January 2008, Clemens appeared on 60 Minutes to address the report. He insisted that his longevity was due to his, quote, hard work, not PEDs. The next day, he sued McNamee for defamation. That February, 
the two men were summoned before Congress. They confirmed that Andy Pettit had told them Clemens took HGH in 1999 or 2000. Clemens told them that Pettit must have, quote, misremembered. Over the remainder of the four-hour hearing, he stumbled over his words, interrupted others, and accused his former trainer of lying. At any point, Roger could have admitted wrongdoing, and everything probably would have gone away, said Earl Ward, McNamee's attorney. But he kept digging a deeper and deeper grave. It was over. Clemens was asked to stay away from the Astros' facilities. His endorsement deals were cancelled. His name was removed from the Roger Clemens Institute for Sports Medicine. In 2010, he was indicted by a grand jury for making false statements to Congress, and while he was eventually acquitted, it did little to change the minds of the public. In 2013, his first year of eligibility for the Hall of Fame, Roger Clemens received 37.6% of the vote, far short of the 75% required for induction. He would never get more than 65, and fell off the ballot in 2022. Roger Clemens has never publicly admitted to taking steroids. Even if he did, it's not clear that it would do him any good. Sure, he still has his money. His cars, clothes, and house won't be taken away. But the respect of his peers, the love of his fans, his legacy, those things have been lost. Possibly for good.